Well, a warm welcome this evening to the long 19th century. And we're going to talk tonight about uh, the Japanese influence on uh, the late 19th century art, in particularly in Europe and uh, the USA. And for this talk, uh, we, we're going to look a little bit about um, Japan, um, but the Orient in general, because um, its influence upon uh, Western art was absolutely enormous and uh, really changed the, his, the, the course of um, Western art, leading, leading to modernism. So it's quite a wide ranging talk tonight, and it touches on a number of uh, talks that I've done previously. Uh, and I hope, um, hope some of the images will be um, both familiar, but some will be surprising to you as well. So it's a very interesting period um, that we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, just to, going to take you through. Uh, uh, there will be a PDF of this. Uh, these are two timelines. Uh, basically, uh, we, we, it's the bringing together of two very different worlds. And uh, it particularly, uh, the, the axis point is 1853, when uh, the first uh, major um, uh, breakthrough with um, uh, American contact with uh, Japan began. But we're going to look a little bit at, into the antecedents. We look at the Edo period in, in, in J Japanese art and moving into the Meiji era uh, from 1868. Uh, of course, it's, an, it's a period um, with uh, different types of engagement, some uh, particularly from Britain's point of view, um, uh, it uh, is coloured by our relationship, uh, a poor relationship actually with China as well, um, which affects uh, some of our attitudes uh, towards um, the art of the Orient. Uh, so we're going to just have a little look at a background to this and how uh, um, art from from the east has, has um, broadly uh, interacted with um, uh, the academies within within Europe and uh, some artists. So, if we go back to the 18th century, uh, we look at these rather um, characteristic, um, uh, rather vague sort of in interactions in painting, particularly like people like Boucher, the Chinese Garden. That's a good one on the left there. You can see. Um, we look at um, uh, Antoine Watteau uh, from the beginning of the 18th century, who's uh, um, appropriated a number of uh, sort of vaguely Chinese um, backgrounds within within his work. Um, the great vogue for chinoiserie in the 18th century, the Chinese wallpapers, uh, particularly if we look in London, we think of the, the Royal Gardens at Kew with the uh, great pagoda of, of Kew from 1763. And then we think of its um, uh, the influence of um, uh, Chinese um, design and art upon, upon furniture. And so these these things seep into uh, our look at um, into visual art, which is our concern this evening, particularly in uh, garden design, furniture and pottery. Um, but uh, uh, really tonight I'm looking at the engage at our engagement with with Japan. Um, so there was very there was uh, almost um, a wall around Japan in, in many ways as regards to trade. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, but in the um, 18th century, we have we have um, Joshua Reynolds, particularly painting this painting on the left here of Wang Yi Tong from 1776, a Chinaman. Uh, so it, it, there was obviously a great interest in, in, in painting uh, uh, different characters. Uh, and indeed, there was a Chinese artist, um, uh, Chan Yi Kua, who exhibited at the Royal Academy. That's an example of his work uh, there below. And there's a painting of him by John Hamilton Mortimer. Uh, George Chinnery, a little bit later, painted a, a, a Chinese woman seated wearing flowers in her hair and jade earrings. So th these, these were sort of uh, antecedents to a lot of what we're going to see tonight. But uh, with regards uh, to Japan, it, it was a very different scene. We must also remember in, in the, the, of the peculiar situation that Britain found itself in in the 1840s with the, with the Opium Wars taking place and uh, uh, the um, 
very, very significant uh, uh, military um, uh, interaction but against, against China at this time, which somewhat coloured our, uh, our views on um, uh, uh, China and, uh, and, the, and the Far East. Uh, and uh, we, we think of, the, of um, the East India Company at this particular time. Here's, two, here's, here's a painting on the right by Richard Simkin, which uh, actually depicts um, uh, one, of, uh, one of the battles that took place during the, uh, the Opium War period. So let's move, but we come to uh, really the closed um, kingdom of, of, of Japan. And uh, whilst uh, I've listed some of the artists who may be familiar to uh, some of you um, who, who may have an interest in, in uh, uh, print, print making, Japanese prints, uh, but these, are, these were not household names in 19th century um, Europe but became so and became very, very important, particularly in, in uh, France. Um, and many of you will have called, heard of Hokusai, uh, Kitagawa, um, Kunyoshi, uh, Hiroshigi, um, Aranubu, and Aishi. All of these were, were artists whose uh, printmaking had a significant influence upon uh, Western art. Now, um, the uh, art that they would, the, the art depicts um, what is known as, as the floating world, uh, the ukiyo-e, and this, this is a, a rough translation, the Buddhist meaning of it is, is a sad world, or, the, or a, a world that is of, uh, devoted to pleasure, to um, the perhaps the beauty of nature, but uh, very much about um, uh, the, uh, the world of pleasure along, along the Sumida River particularly, and, and uh, the print, printmakers uh, depicted much of uh, this, this uh, the life of um, pleasure um, in Edo, which is, of course, became modern day uh, Tokyo. And, uh, and so there is a parallel, actually, with the, with the, with the emergence of um, uh, the bohemian world within, uh, within uh, particularly in, in, in the French, among the French artists and uh, the avant-garde artists at the time. And so we're going to see a little bit of that and how uh, some of these artists influenced uh, uh, art in France and in Great Britain and latterly in the uh, USA, of course. So, um, the, there, was a, there was during, um, really from uh, 1633, uh, right up to 1853, uh, uh, an almost closed um, policy. So, uh, uh, this, this policy really covered um, this, this 200 year period, slightly over 200 year period, uh, where, um, there was to be no con contact between um, any Japanese ship or any native of Japan um, of any class within Japan with anybody outside of, um, of, of, the, of the country. And indeed, if a, a, a sailor were to get shipwrecked on an outlying island, he could not return uh, back to Japan. And indeed, his family would be in mortal danger. Uh, there was strict edicts against any Christian missionaries. And uh, it was extremely, um, extremely for forcefully applied. Uh, there was some contact with um, uh, uh, at the time uh, through uh, uh, some of the Portuguese traders and uh, some of, uh, particularly some of the Dutch East India traders um, were able to uh, make some contact and some trade. And this was on um, an island outside of Nagasaki. So the, the one exception uh, in, in Europe uh, to uh, trade with Japan were, was the Dutch and the du Dutch East India Company, particularly trading out of Delft. And so uh, we get um, uh, throughout um, the, this, this the great, the, the golden age of uh, Dutch art, we, get, we do get uh, to see some uh, Japanese uh, art uh, or Japanese pottery. Um, and uh, also that was to actually influence Delft Ware within, um, within Holland at the time. And, uh, and it wasn't possible in Europe until uh, the contact with, the, with um, Japan that we, that we were able to produce our own uh, high quality uh, blue and white um, 
uh, porcelain of, it, of, it, of this type. And so it was this, this trade um, took, took place uh, with, um, with, the, with the Dutch East India Company. And you can see actually in a number of little, there's William Kels uh, still, still life there. You can see an example from, uh, from this period, from, from the, the, the late 17th century. And there's a picture of Delft. Um, and uh, so the traders, the Dutch traders, were able to come uh, to this um, man-made island off uh, Nagasaki, and it was a uh, Dejima Island, a uh, largely wooden and constructed island. And on this island, uh, the Dutch East India Company were able to trade um, with uh, Japan under very, very strict uh, conditions. Uh, there's a lovely little uh, print that I, I photographed when I was at the British Museum of uh, some uh, Japanese watching almost through a screen at the Dutchman trading in, in, in Edo. So we, we got that and there's a little uh, picture of the actual island itself there. So it was very, very strictly enforced was this, was this ban upon uh, contact with the West. But there was, there was through the Dutch, some, some contact and uh, some prints of uh, great uh, 17th century Dutch paintings um, uh, were also um, available to, to certain of the um, uh, Japanese artists. And in fact, Hokusai in the early part of the 19th century uh, made eight views in Edo in Dutch style. And these are very, very interesting because these are an amalgamation of uh, what a, a, a Japanese artist um, sort of interpreting um, a, 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 in his own style uh, what he had seen of Western art, and it was pretty limited. Indeed, uh, his um, uh, dealing with, with um, a Western perspective, single point perspective, is unique and, and, and interesting too. Um, and we, so if you look at the uh, rise step. So I've got there in the little example on the left, and you look at the picture above it, you can see how, how Hokusai engages with um, Western art, but in a very peculiar way. No less skilled, of course, because to cut one of these great wood blocks it, uh, was a tremendous uh, part of the um, part of uh, great skill at the time and um, required a whole workshop and a whole group of very highly skilled craftsmen to produce such prints. So they didn't have canvas painting. That would be an that, that wouldn't have been what he would have seen. He would have seen uh, um, probably some etchings or, or engravings. So those are some examples of Hokusai's engagement with uh, um, West Western art as such. But it, but it but it grew and it it is evidenced in a number of Hokusai's and Hiroshige's um, prints as the nineteen uh, as um, uh, throughout uh, this period. But it was really the um, contact in uh, 1853 uh, by the black ships of Commodore Matthew Perry that we have the first real contact and indeed the beginning of a, of a trading agreement between the Japanese um, and uh, uh, the, the West as um, through, through Perry's fleet. And so once, once after, throughout the 1850s, gradually, uh, that there was an opening up and 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 uh, and a trade between the two. Uh, the Japanese were interested, of course, in things like um, uh, weaponry uh, that the West could provide, but there were there were other goods that were were very important that could become important to Japan. And although it had been a period of of, of great um, under the Shogun, had been a period of great uh, uh, sort of uh, stability in some ways, although very brutally enforced. It um, it was a period of um, increasing um, prosperity for some of the the the, um, uh, the the merchants within Japan, but it was a very insular society. And there, but there was much produced, and it was uh, beginning to. Be, and so through Matthew. Um, uh, Matthew Perry, we, we got some of a more widely distributed, particularly these um, uh, UK um, prints, which uh, the woodblock prints, which of course uh, became so influ influential to uh, Western, uh, uh, Western art. 
So I just I thought this would be quite helpful because there, 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 there's a sort of parallel in a way. We have the the Crookshank cartoon in, of 1867 of the uh, uh, British beehive, the, 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 the sort of hierarchical system of the empire. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because in, if you look, if you think in Japan, uh, the, there's the Tokugawa household who were who who. Um, who effectively have been uh, in charge of Japan for over 200 years. Beneath them, the military rulers of Japan, the shogun. Then there were the, the warlords, the samurai class. Um, and then beneath them were very, very strict uh, system where, where and nobody really moved in any way between one class and another. It was very, very strict. Uh, there was the artisan class the merchant class, the peasant class, and then old people and children. All these are depicted within, within these floating world prints. Uh, you also get uh, uh, um, particularly uh, a focus in these, in these prints, uh, particularly of the kabuki actors and dancers, the geisha, the traditional female entertainers, and the Yoshiwara, who were the licensed courtesans. And if we, and there is a direct um, uh, parallel between the types of subject matter of these and what was to happen in uh, later 19th century painting. If we think of artists like Toulouse Lautrec, um, Claude Monet, and uh, Edgar Degas, particularly, the, 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 these subject matters became much more important than class, classical or religious subject matters. They're about. Um, uh, the pleasures of life and um, uh, and indeed it was our own floating world so there was a sort of parallel and the influence was through these prints um there was also a great appreciation of nature in 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 but in a very different way and we look at hokusai's um uh, depictions of waterfalls or his 36 views of mount fuji we see a very different approach to the landscape than we do in the west um, perhaps only one parallel might be someone like Alexander Cousins from the previous century who did these um, uh, blot, blot landscapes, these abstract landscapes which have a quasi-oriental feel. But certainly they, they weren't about direct observation in quite the same way that a Western artist would approach the subject, uh, someone like Turner, for instance. Uh, so they're peculiar, but they are something that were very, very attractive. And uh, certainly the, 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 the colours that were achieved within prints were quite unlike anything that was happening in Europe at the time. So here we are. Um, the first real encounter in London with, with this, apart from um, a very, very limited amount of um, art uh, in the uh, Great Exhibition of 1851 was particularly the London International Exhibition of, of um, 1862, when uh, um, Sir Robert Alcock um, exhibited uh, his collection of Jap in the Japanese pavilion, and it was sensation. It was absolutely um, uh, was seized upon uh, in, 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 in London, uh, particularly by those uh, artists who eventually uh, formed a part of what we, we call asceticism within um, uh, uh, European art. There was a, there was a great uh, um, appetite, really, for the, the, these um, uh, decorative and uh, the visual arts. But the, particularly in the London International Exhibition, it wasn't the prints so much as the, um, uh, the, the lacquers, the bamboos, the ivories and handcrafted pottery, which had an influence. Um, in Paris, uh, also in 1862, were, were the Goncourt uh, brothers, and they were they made a particular um, champion of the uh, prints, the, the woodblock prints, and these um, very important. In fact, they opened up their own uh, shop, really, with some of these these Japanese prints, which became so influential. So slowly but surely, moving towards the, the Paris exhibition of 1867, uh, there was an opening up and, and uh, very often some of these, these, these prints, which were single, single uh, almost a sort of A4 type size print, uh, sometimes were used to wrap other objects, but it became the print themselves that became so influential upon um, Western painting. And... Uh, so we shouldn't just think of a single artist, really, when we think of Japanese um, uh, uh, making as such. Uh, uh, first of all, there is the publisher, um, the Hanmoto. Uh, the artist is the Eshi, and then there's the block cutter and the printer, um, all, all, of, all of whom 
play uh, part of this, what we call the quartet. So they all work in tandem with one another. And um, if we notice the little um, boxes, the cartouches on the prints, you'll see that all of these are, are actually actually listed. We come to find that out. Um, the most of the prints are printed on cherry cherry wood, and there's what's called a P block, which is a master block, which is the, the outline, and then the colours are printed. It's a very highly skilled uh, way of um, uh, reproduction, really, and it's very unlike anything in, in Europe. Um, and these the, the the people who actually block cut some of Hocker's size uh, drawings, for instance, he would draw it and it'd be stuck onto the cherry wood, and then it would be carved out and uh, uh, to such a degree that they could even replicate brush marks and um, even the, 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 the most deft sort of little uh, marks could be uh, reproduced on these on these plates. Different to what was going on in, in London, the Dalziel brothers cutting the wood blocks for the Moxon and Tennyson, for instance. It's a, diff a different sort of approach, but um, uh, it, was, it was no less skilled. And indeed, it was a part of an enormous tradition. And many of the names of some of the artists, too, uh, the families also worked in families, um, too. So they handed down the skills to one another. Uh, so it's sometimes quite difficult. You think of it as uh, Hokusai, but it might it might be his daughter or or um, Hiroshiki. There, there, there are others who work under that name as well. And indeed, some of the artists, as they um, evolved, um, actually had uh, different names as, 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 as they um, became more mature. So uh, we've looked at this painting before, Whistler's Symphony in White Number no. Two, Little White Girl. But this is a great example of how um, 1862 uh, had a, a profound effect upon many of the artists. And uh, no, James McNeil Whistler is, of course, one of the um, main artists who uh, who engaged with the art of Japan. And so, if we look at his Caprice in Purple and Gold on the top right hand. Uh, of my slide there you can see uh, that one uh, with a with a woman in a kimono examining the Japanese prints uh, notice also the azaleas in in the bottom of the, the little white girl the Japanese fan the pottery um, the uh, things that were so distinctive and, and Whistler picked out and some of the uh, impressionists and post-impressionists picked out were the um, emphasising using dark outlines. We noticed that in a number of later artists like Maurice Denis and Paul Gauguin, for instance. Um, the limited depth of field within the painting, uh, flatten, flat areas of non-modulated colour, um, the no chiaroscuro that is that the, we, we the, the the sort of the rembrandt effects were all out it was all very much uh, on a single picture plane um and the compositions would also be very often asymmetric and these things very much attracted uh, the avant-garde artists of the late 19th century both in uh, particularly in france but but also to some extent uh, in in london and uh, in 1867, here we have this, uh, the Satsuma Pavilion. And uh, this was where uh, there was an, e an even deeper engagement with the art of Japan and we, and uh, particularly uh, decorative arts as well. And uh, particularly furniture, we think of um, Edward William Goodwin's furniture and as a little part of a, a furniture catalog of at the time. So it really took the, the um, Japanese took a real, um, a really a, a primary place really within uh, how art was was to change within within the 1860s. Um, Whistler fully engaged with it in, in uh, if you look at one of his paintings with the Japanese fan in the middle there he was really flattening out his colour and and uh, absolutely obsessed with the art of Japan and he would refer to himself as a Japanese rather than a Chinese artist because there wasn't much distinction at this time between the two um, in some ways, uh, but they saw the art of Japan as far more refined uh, because of its uh, isolation. It, 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 was, it was much more um, inviting to so many um, of these avant-garde Western artists. And, uh, uh, and and the collection of Japanese prints and rivalries collecting Japanese prints and Japanese pottery uh, was legendary actually during this period. Um, and is this, it is the period of the development of French Impressionism too, and it it, it really impressed um, uh, Claude 
Claude Monet and this is his impression sunrise from five years later after the after the 1867 exhibition um again the, the, the flattening of the of, of the picture plane um simplification uh, and there's and there's there are great links between uh, some of the uh, front running impressionists and, uh, and and the prints as we've often looked at and uh, these were the first in what has become known as the Impressionist Exhibition was in 1872, and that was took place in Nadar's studio in Paris, the photographer. And uh, that was, uh, many of the paintings there have been linked with, uh, compositionally with, with Japanese prints. And I can show a few of them to you. Of course, in 1872, we have this uh, a very good example of Whistler fully engaging with his old Battersea Bridge painting, Nocturne in Blue and Gold, and if we look at the Hiroshigi uh, bamboo yards, we can see a direct connection there. Look at Claude Monet's painting of the wooden bridge in the lower right-hand corner from 1872. And we can see artists from throughout Europe were, were obsessed with, with, with these, these prints that were coming uh, from the Sumida River uh, and, and the floating world. And, and this was all part of the influence uh, to their um, painting at this particular time. Uh, no more so than the, the Nocturne in Black and Gold, the Falling Rocket, 1875, this great, very controversial painting that Ruskin uh, uh, accused Whistler for fling the, the, the pot of paint in the public space and then uh, Whistler taking Ruskin to court. But if you have a look, uh, it isn't so, it, it isn't so uh, innovative. If you look at it next to um, Hiroshige's uh, fireworks, um, uh, print here. You can just see where Whis what, what Whistler was um, uh, um, mirroring in many ways. He was mirroring what he was seeing in Japanese prints and prints of uh, fireworks on on and and the Edo prints. So uh, there was a very direct connection there. And of course, Whistler would also uh, use Oriental characters uh, um, at, and and his own his own monogram as well. He uh, was very much. Um, based on, on, on uh, Japanese script inside of his work. This one here is in uh, the Institute of Arts in Detroit, and a, a very fine painting it is too. Uh, Whistler too, of course, was advocating at this, by this stage, art for art's sake. Uh, it, was, he was, it was art that would, was not uh, to be connected with uh, the, the grandiose subject matter of the Royal Academy, the, the classical, um, uh, subject matter or uh, uh, indeed even even the minor genre subjects he was interested in in art which was for beauty and he saw that in Japanese uh, printmaking. Um, Monet too and if we look at uh, Monet often referred to this uh, as his Chinese painting with flags at the uh, Terrasse at Saint Adresse from 1867, the year of the uh, year of the exhibition in Paris, actually. And but he based it upon this this print uh, from Hokusai, a Temple of 500 Rekam. And if you look at the Mount Fuji in the background, but you can see how Monet has divided his picture into th essentially into three bands, similar to the way Hokusai has has uh, developed his his print here. And so uh, once again, uh, we, we, we see the interaction between the art of Japan and, and that, of, um, that of the West. And uh, also uh, really both, I mean, Hokusai had, uh, had used, had, had worked with Western perspective, single point perspective, uh, but in a way Mon Monet too uh, plays upon uh, the, um, Japanese view of art as well that um, uh, the uh, far uh, about dividing up a composition in this way and until this point in time it was very it, it would be unusual to uh, actually have a have a painting um, composed in this particular way. And this is what caused such great controversy. Some of the Impressionist paintings were made fun of for their asymmetry and uh, uh, their lack of um, their sort of central uh, pyramidic forms and, uh, and, and lack of classical antecedents. Uh, so there we are. That, that's, that's a good example of a Monet inf directly influenced by a, um, uh, by, by a Japanese print. Indeed, he, he uh, if you think of this painting of Kami in, in, in this kimono, one of many uh, such paintings of this period where the great fashions 
uh, of Paris were influenced and the kimonos who came over to the, the uh, um, influence much of the uh, Paris fashion houses and of course the great vogue for Japanese fans. We look at in the background of Manet's portrait of Emile Zola at the time, and there we are. We can see the sumo wrestler is in the background in the print, and we can see that Zola sits in front of a of a screen and uh, and pottery even on his table as well. So it's, you can see uh, how um, how much uh, it was affecting uh, uh, the France of the eighteen sixties. It was Philip Berti in 1874 who uh, coined the term Japanese, Japanese um, which really was uh, art that was totally uh, under the influence of, of, the, of uh, the Japanese prints and uh, uh, all things uh, oriental. And we can see that this went on throughout the um, late 19th century. By the 1880s, Monet had started to develop his uh, gardens at Giverne, uh, uh, directly basing uh, the layout of his garden upon some of the prints of the 36 views of, of Mount Fuji. Uh, from Okusai and, and of course the bridge within the garden too is directly based upon um, uh, the prints that he would have seen of, of the Sumida River. And it wasn't just, uh, wasn't just the uh, canvas painters of the time, it was, it, it, we could see it in all sorts of things. Um, Christopher Dresser's uh, was one of the, one, an interesting character. Um, he, his, um, he contributed the grammar, grammar of Ornament from uh, 1856, but he also published design books later on. And he also was the representative of the British government and uh, in exchange of, of, of great examples of British de of design and then Japanese design. And uh, if you look at something like this, this, this little mix in this little watercolour from uh, Kate Haylar, uh, the souvenirs of Japan from 1883. You can see some of the, the, the goods that were so influencing the aesthetics of uh, Victorian England. There's not necessarily a direct correspondence with William Morris, who was much more influenced by the medieval world or the world of the past. But even so, he was also working with woodblocks and, and he even had, had an eye out to the different ways in which colours, simple three or four colours could work with one another. Uh, just like the um, printmakers of Japan, so there, there was there was a connection there, uh, or, the, or albeit um, uh, it, it never it, it, the Japanese printmakers never had the the decorative approach that uh, Morris uh, uh, is so distinct for. But here we are, here's Whistler uh, in full flow. Now there were two real streams that happened as a result of the Japanese um, Japanese influence upon the aesthetic movement, really. Um, uh, if we look at the painting here, Symphony in Flesh, Colour and Pink of, uh, uh, of Leyland, um, there we can see um, a, a wonderful example of flattening out of the surface. This is 10 years on from uh, the Symphony in White and uh, Whistler has become far more sophisticated with this. So he develops this form of asceticism, whereas Albert Moore of a similar period in his painting, the painting on the right, uh, but, um, paints a sort of classically influenced asceticism. But art, both are art for art's sake, really, in that they don't depict any particular subject. One, of course, is a direct portrait. One is uh, is a vaguely classical setting. Um, but they're, they're, they're two different real different approaches. And one can even say with Leighton's work, too, that there was this great uh, uh, great emphasis on just on, on, on pure beauty and, and art uh, of beauty. But of course, uh, Whistler took it to a great uh, to great extremes. And this no more so than the Peacock Room, uh, which is now in Washington, D.C., which was for um, Frederick Leyland, the great shipping um, uh, magnate. And uh, Whistler's designs for this and, and the correspondence about this, we've talked about this before. Uh, but it was uh, it was also um, for this great collection of of the um, uh, the the porcelain and 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 the, the many many um, uh, of the uh, wealthy period people of this time, particularly the um, people like Leyland, collected um, a lot of 
uh, a lot of pottery and um and so this was this was really set it off beautifully and they've now assembled a different collection he, the actual original Leyland collection was lost but um uh through uh examining photographs they've been able to put back something which approximates to the Leyland collection uh there's also Rossetti's portrait of Leyland too and we must see that all these artists were working together even directly or indirectly were influenced by the art of Japan. And if we look at Hokusai's drawing of a phoenix and peacock, I think you can see in that drawing by Hokusai uh, something um, that really directly influenced the great peacocks on the wall of the, um, of the peacock room uh, uh, here. And Rossetti too was uh, uh, very inf influenced during the 1860s by the uh, by aestheticism and fashion. Um, whilst he didn't purport to paint any ja so-called Japanese subjects, uh, we can see there is a piece, a lovely piece of porcelain there. He also um, wanted to snap up some of the lo lovely fabrics that were coming about at the time. So uh, Mona Rosa and Mona Fana from 1867 and 68. Um, uh, were also uh, the, if you lo look at this lovely uh, robe here, it's very much, very much influenced by the um, uh, wonderful fabrics that were coming available at this time. Princep too, in my Lady Betty, uh, used exactly the same in that painting. There, we notice the fan in the background on the screen, uh, very prevalent in a lot of aesthetic movement uh, paintings. Uh, but it was James Tiso who really. Um, engaged much more fully with uh what he's what he wanted to do with the jap with the kimonos and the fashions of japan and this this japanese bather uh was one of his more controversial japanese paintings this is when he was still working in paris and uh, uh, uh because this kimono opens from the front and not a, 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 a kimono of a courtesan would open from the front um but to the geisha, it would be tied at the back. So uh, it leads one to uh, suspect that this is um, uh, um, uh, a licensed courtesan as depicted in many of the uh, floating world prints. Uh, but, but again, um, uh, Tiso's concern is upon uh, uh, the decorative qualities of, of uh, Japanese uh, costumes and uh, his, his partner, Mrs. Newton um, uh, is depicted in a number of these. Um, even after Tiso's uh, conversion or reconversion to Catholicism, he still associates Japan with um, uh, sort of uh, the allure of uh, the allure of the East and um, almost the temptation of the East. And so he paints the uh, the prodigal son in foreign climes, eighteen eighty one to eighty two, uh, depicted a, a woman dancing before um, the prodigal son in a kimono. And that's a famous painting by Tiso. Tiso also uh, the Japanese scroll, 1873. Um, his his paintings are um, this. This gives you example. Uh, during this period, were were totally uh, captivated by the art of Japan, but very in a very different way to Whistler. They're far more uh, well. Of course, they're far more detailed. They're almost um, Dutch in their, in a uh, way that they're painted. They're almost like a Dutch 18th, 18th century or um, 17th century surface and uh, uh, pre-Raphaelite to some extent in a way in, in their, in their uh, observation and detail, natural details. Uh, Japanese vase is a great example of, um, of, of his art from this period, but he, he snapped up a lot of these great um, kimonos and then he came to work in London and uh, his, he is... Um, one of the great artists for uh, depicting uh, women's fashion, particularly, and of course the Japanese influence, as we see here in the hammock, 1879, or and and certainly the Japanese fan and the uh, um, uh, parasols were became a, a great feature of late 19th century art, and uh, obviously echoed in a number of artists at the period, and um, even even in Renoir's um, uh, painting of the umbrellas from 1881 to 86. Uh, links with uh, the, 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 the idea of the Japanese parasol. Um, George Henry from the, the Glasgow School in a Japanese garden shows, shows the same sort of thing. So the, these, these, like the Japanese fans, became a great feature of later Victorian art, beautifully painted by Tiso, of course. And of course, uh, John Singer Sargent and Claude Monet also paint similar views of, of um, women with parasols. 
Uh, a sort of lighter style as well was Alfred Stevens, the Belgian painter. Um, there we are. There's, there's one painting of his. He did quite a number of these Japanese uh, kimono paintings. Uh, even Atkinson Grimshaw painting Daydreams shows uh, young women often contemplating uh, either pieces of pottery or a Japanese fan. Um, Camille Pissarro, the French, great father of French Impressionism, did a number of Japanese fan designs. And then there's the lower, uh, the chromolithic graphs of the period, not by very well-known artists painting um, uh, these, these Japanese uh, women with Japanese kimonos. So it's sort of light, lighter art as well going on at this time. Um, John Everett Millet uh, in his Hearts of Trumps in the background is, a, is, is an oriental screen. And if you notice the pagoda behind the Armstrong sister, uh, Millet also in his painting, Miss Davidson, uh, and a nod to Whistler paints a little Japanese fan propped up against a rather uh, Victorian uh, sort of chair. And, um, but we notice again, uh, it, it comes into all the artists, whether whether they consider them high art or low art or exhibiting at the Academy, it goes everywhere. And the fans uh, 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 are there in, in the, all um, so many of the paintings of the period and the fashions of the period. Millet is a, a slightly freer painting than, than, than Tiso of the period, of course. Um, and there we have it. And, and, and uh, uh, Edward Lindley Sanborn uh, satirizes this whole cult, really. And here he has Millet in a kimono uh, looking at a, a Japanese model. And he's and and of course in uh, both in in Punch at the time there was there were very many such cartoons as this one the six mark teapot uh, where which uh, shows uh, this couple uh, in front of a, a, a Japanese screen and Japanese pottery and and and, and so much of the sort of uh, cult of, of Japan was was in was satirized and parodied. And there were parodies of it, and we see him into it too, even in the in in the Yellow Book of of um, Aubrey Beardsley and his illustration uh, to Pan Magazine. All of these influ greatly influenced by uh, Japanese printmaking, and indeed uh, some of the erotic subject matter that appears in the Yellow Book is directly influenced by uh, Japanese uh, erotic art of the period. Uh, John Singer Sargent's Lily Lily Rose. Um, uh, 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 is um, another one with the Japanese fans. And if we look at Hiroshige's Japanese fan, and we can think of Sargent too, the Japanese girl at her toilet, uh, uh, all of those uh, directly influenced by Japanese printmaking. Um, and uh, uh, it would be well understood during this period that this that even artists who we don't sort of think of as primarily uh, uh, aesthetic movement artists uh, still uh, have got this um, uh, great link with, um, with, with the prints of the, of the period uh, that were ubiquitous. Of course, uh, the, the, uh, Gilbert and Sal Sullivan's Mikado, which went on at the Savoy Theatre in 1885, uh, very, very successful and really took, um, took London by storm. Perhaps more a comment on Victorian society than it is, what it is of, of Japan. But um, uh, as we can see, the costumes too, when it was put on in, in Paris, uh, the Parisian production 10 years later, um, the appropriation of kimonos, and we see even there Toulouse Lautrec dressed up in a in a Japanese kimono. Um, uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum have a number of the uh, original uh, watercolor backgrounds for the Savoy Theatre production of 1885, and uh, uh, they uh, and, and the costumes were another way that the public engaged with this with, with Japan. Um, so the Mikado, a very important uh, part of uh, this whole cult for, for Japanese um, design, Japanese art, um, and sort of Western, the appro appropriate. Uh, over in the USA, uh, particularly William Merritt Chase, uh, these are two examples of his um, Japanese influence paintings. Um, and he follows really very much in, in the footsteps of James McNeil Whistler, perhaps, perhaps uh, less he wasn't as radical as Whistler by any means, but uh, his paintings show a great deal of uh, influence from Japanese um, printmaking. And there we have a, a painting of a young woman in a kimono looking at some Japanese prints in front of a screen. Uh, but the artist who is perhaps 
the most engaged with Japan was a young man who worked uh, for Goopils in, in London uh, during the uh, early part of the 1870s for two or three years he spent in London. Uh, he later comes back and then he makes the journey to Paris in 1880, 1886-87, comes to Paris and he encounters Japanese art for the first time um, at uh, the Tambourine Cafe and also through uh, Per Tangi's um, uh, Cullerman's workshop and the print and, and print cellar. And uh, he paints this portrait of Per Tangi in 1887. And Amango, unlike many of the other artists we've seen, perhaps apart from Whistler, really engaged with a new style of painting that is firm, solid outlines, a flattening of picture plane, uh, very, very vibrant uh, color, uh, color relationships, and the art of Japan becomes his obsession. And so we can see it particularly in these two paintings, but we see it too also in his portraits where he cuts off uh, the head in, in, in a very non-Western way at the time. Uh, if we look at Kitagawa's uh, print on the left, um, great influence upon Vincent van Gogh. And, uh, uh, and we can understand van Gogh a lot better if we if we look at uh, some of these some of his the prints that he, he collected and the the van Gogh museum in in Amsterdam have put on wonderful um displays of van Gogh's own collection of prints that uh, that he consulted frequently uh, and uh, it's very interesting to what he actually wrote about these these as well um, and he is also his contact with the picture dealer Alexander Reed um, in, in, in Paris. Um, him and Theo shared an apartment. Of course, Reed later becomes associated with the artists of Glasgow as well. And so we get that, that, that lovely link there. Um, the, and there's an example of Van Gogh squaring up uh, a, a Japanese um, uh, magazine. And there you can see it squared up and then he paints it. And so uh, there are a number of such paintings and uh, uh, that Van Gogh actually did directly uh, from uh, prints uh, that, he, that he had and um, examples like that. Um, no, more so than the great wave of uh, Kanagawa. And that was in the back of Van Gogh, when Van Gogh was in the asylum in San Remy, it is uh, highly likely that it was the great wave that influenced uh, Starry Night. Um, it was uh, because it was painted from memory, um, but the, certainly the dynamics within the work Starry Night, which is in New York, many of you have probably seen it, um, uh, is, is, is very, very closely paralleled with, with the Hokusai, the Great Wave. And it wasn't even even the realist uh, Gustave Courbet would have been uh, aware of uh, such prints of these um, of of the coast. So uh, it's sort of almost turning the coast of Normandy, and then Monet's paintings on Belle Isle, very similar similar to Hiroshige's um, um, pinnacles of rock there, and and the great rocks at Etretta. And uh, also, which are uh, featuring Claude Monet's paintings, uh, we can see that there is a very, very close relationship between uh, uh, that depicted in front in in printmaking, in Japanese printmaking, and um, certainly uh, Monet's art. Where uh, also waters the activity and the idea of the movement of water, which is an obsession of so many of the um, Japanese printmakers too, uh, trying to represent movement graphically. Um, uh, art, the impressionist artists were also very interested in that, and um, Monet particularly. Paul Cezanne, a great collector of, of Hokusai's 36 views of Mount Fuji, and that's unsurprising that it also had an influence upon his great series of Mont Saint Victoire, uh, which he continually painted in, in almost as an obsessive way that uh, uh, Hokusai does views of Mount Fuji, or Mount Fuji appears in so many of Hokusai's um, prints, and uh, uh, the, the great the great um, backdrop to his thirty six views and then the hundred views of Mount Fuji, and one can see a direct parallel there. Um, our own Sir Alfred East, who was commissioned by the Fine Arts Society, and he went out into rural Japan unusually. Um, perhaps you can make out Mount Fuji in the background of this painting here, Sayonara, um, uh, from 1880. 
89 and uh, with the Japanese lanterns again. But uh, uh, look at the frame too, uh, all, all very much influenced by uh, the, his time in Japan. And uh, he's an artist too, who, who totally immersed himself in, in the art of Japan, actually going there, because of course Van Gogh didn't go to Japan or uh, none, of the, none of the French Impressionists went there. Um, some of the Glasgow boys did, and so that, well, that was interesting that some actually did take the trip. And Alfred East was one British artist who did actually go to Japan to produce a more authentic uh, form of um, uh, uh, art from, based on, on Japanese art. And then we have, of course, uh, Edgar Degas. Um, if we look at the prints there, uh, by, up in the top left-hand corner, and then you look at women combing their hair by Degas from 1875. Particularly Mary Cassatt is worth mentioning because her wonderful prints, the domestic prints, uh, very much echo uh, what she saw in, in, in the, uh, the floating world prints that uh, were so... Uh, interesting to French artists of the period. And of course, Mary Cassatt is one of the great, great uh, Impressionist artists who uh, depicts motherhood and uh, uh, domestic scenes in such a beautiful and uh, uh, lively way. Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, as I've shown you before, he dressed in a kimono um, at times, um, but his great prints uh, for the cabarets, uh, the Moulin Rouge particularly, um, were very much influenced by Japanese printmaking. We, we can just see the direct relationship there. Um, again, the, the influence uh, upon the trek was incalculable, particularly some of his horse racing uh, drawings too were very much influenced by Japanese printmakings of, the horse, of horses. And then the Glasgow boys, as I say, uh, Joseph Crawhall's uh, um, White Drake, 1895, we look at some of the paintings, the painting above it, um, but very much influenced by uh, these uh, artists of the period. Hornell's an interesting one because he actually, he again went to Japan and he he um, really thoroughly sort of uh, took on the, 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 the decorative qualities of uh, what he saw in Japanese um, uh, kimonos and uh, and in screens and that sort of thing. Uh, James Guthrie as well, um, both influenced by Whistler, but also uh, seeks to engage with with the art of Japan and um, certainly through Reed as well, who his um, his prints and uh, what he brought back from Japan and a lot of these things uh, are part of the Burrell collection now in Glasgow. Um, and there we are, George Henry, one of the Glasgow boys, and you can see there very directly uh, how much they were influenced by um, by these sort of prints. Uh, you can see on the right there, and uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps so rather self conscious, almost to a point of illustration rather than something innovative, rather like unlike a Van Gogh or a, or a Whistler or even a Monet. Uh, these, are, these are a little bit more illustrative, a little bit more self-conscious, I think, in some ways. But no less, they are interesting of their type. And uh, of course, as the century wore on, we, we get um, examples like this. Um, uh, if we look at this, this print down on the bottom left hand here, and then we think of a Boston painter, uh, Maurice Prendergast, who very much was influenced by these sort of processional prints that he saw in Japanese uh, printmaking. And they influenced some of these park scenes from the park in Boston or in Central Park in New York. Um, you can see some of these. And uh, he was, also you notice the strong outlines of these too. They uh, very much mirror these um, uh, the prints that, that were so popular at the time. But it was by the end of the um, 19th century that we're getting uh, almost the reverse effect that, in fact, um, a lot of the um, art of the West was now beginning to influence Japanese print printmakers. And so it's almost come come around the other way. And so if we look at this one, which is from 1904, uh, we can see which uh, uh, depicts the, 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 the engagement with the Russian ships there. Um, we can see how Western art was now beginning to influence, influence the Japanese artists. And then again, uh, we come to the great exposition of um, uh, 1900 in, in, in Paris, uh, and we see 
uh, there's a whole new chapter opens out in, into European art, um, which really through people like Whistler, through Monet had, uh, had begun, but it becomes an absolute torrent from this point on. Picasso comes to Paris and we know that uh, it is the art of so many other cultures that now starts to influence Western art in an enormous way, particularly the art of Africa. But still the art of Japan uh, played out its part. And uh, uh, whilst this is just outside of our, our period, I just uh, say how much the art of these prints influenced the arts and crafts movement, particularly Britain, USA, um, Art Nouveau, if we look at the Mukha print there on the right, we can see uh, very much how the flatten, flattening and the outline, all of those things wouldn't have happened without the art of Japan. Um, certainly the Viennese succession, uh, people like Gustav Klimt particularly were influenced by um, the, uh, the idea of using uh, gold and decorative areas within a, a, a flat painting. Um, uh, the idea that uh, particularly also that the actual way art was exhibited rather like Whistler said that you have to really think about the walls, the colour of the walls that you put things on, all very much influenced, uh, uh, have a Japanese aesthetic. Uh, European symbolism and decadence were all influenced by the art of Japan and then the artist colonies uh, from Dunstadt. So we, we have this Real, great meeting of uh, East east and West. And uh, it's, it's small, started with small beginnings in 1853, uh, but it really changed the whole course of, of Western art. Uh, so um, I hope I, this evening I've just uh, touched upon the many ways in which um, uh, the art of uh, Japan became so central to the art of Europe of the late uh, 19th century. <laughs>